Welcome back, geologists, for the second part of human evolution. All right, that brings us into the homo species. So homo species have a number of different types, and I think it's important to talk about how long some of these lasted, and many of them have a nickname. So we'll look at that. If there's a nickname for one of these, that's important. If I didn't list it, obviously you don't need to know it. But the Homo habilis lived from 2.5 to 1.6 million years ago, and it's referred to as the handyman. Obviously, that means they had some tools. Big, important change from our Australopithecus. Now, these are your first stone tool makers. They evolved from Afarensis and Africanus groups. Africanus is the main lineage that would branch off to make the Homo species, but Africanus came from Afarensis, right? We know it coexisted with Africanus for around 200,000 years. That's important to note that there's lap over, right? The brain size was much larger, 700 cubic centimeters. So right now, we'll get into the average size of a human brain right now is somewhere around 1,400-ish you know, 13 to 1400-ish cc's. And so while that's half the size of our brain, that's like almost double what a chimpanzee would be. So it's significantly larger. They had smaller teeth and faces indicating this stuff is all changing in relationship to the foods that they're eating. So they're not very big. They're about 1.2, 1.3 meters tall, but they had long arms compared to modern humans. So did that mean that they still hung out in trees? Maybe. It could mean that they had a need for long arms for something that they were using as habitat resources. Maybe they lived in trees, for all we know. Maybe they, um, maybe they needed to pull things, and so they had long arms. Nevertheless, uh, these are going to be our first more human-like animals we've seen yet. Homo erectus means the Peking man in China and the Java man in Indonesia, most commonly referred to as the Peking man. He lived from 1.8 million years ago, and check this out, to 100,000 years ago. One of the most successful of the Homo species. Very long living span right there. They evolved from Africanus, of course Africanus coming from Afarensis. Their brain size was 800 cc's, up to 1300 cc's. I think that matters because as they change and evolve and they get these bigger brains, they're going to be able to do more, obviously, with what knowledge they have and abilities. They had massive faces, big faces, prominent brow ridges. They had teeth larger than any modern human today indicating that they had specialized foods that they would have need larger teeth for. They're bigger than the prior hominid species we've seen, 1.6 to 1.8 meters in height and got up to 53 to 63 kilograms. Well, they are going to have elongated legs, similar to what you and I would have, and shorter arms compared to the size of their torso, indicating adaptions to life on the ground. These guys are as close to us as we've seen yet. They're going to spread and migrate. The long legs empower them to do that. So as you compare bones of the chimpanzee, Neanderthal, and modern human, you would have noticed there were some differences in the legs, differences in the thickness of the bones, differences in the length of the bones, and most importantly, difference in the ankles and the foot. That matters. These guys made tools. They used fire. We find charcoal with some of their fossil remains and artifacts, and they also lived in groups in caves. Homo sapiens is going to evolve from Homo erectus. Homo heidelbergensis is kind of a fun group to talk about. Many people like the movies, Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit. I know my family is really into all of that. And so this, this particular species is endearing to me because they actually remind me of the description of hobbits <laughs> and they are actually referred to as hobbits. So let's talk about what they are. They live from about 700,000 years ago to 200,000 years ago and then we'll talk about why they're so strange in terms of different from all the other homo species. They only stood about three feet six inches tall. They're short. 
Now, let's look at the rest of this and then compare it to if you have read the books of The Hobbit and seen movies or so forth, you can kind of relate to this. And understand, I've been to Hobbiton in New Zealand to the actual set where they filmed the movie, so this is really dear to my heart to think about this guy. They had a large brain case, a flatter face than older early humans. They had large brow ridges, but what I think is really funny is they had these wide little short bodies which are very unique and definitely in tune with what we see with cold climate humans and uh, still see that today. They could control fire, use wooden spears. They had kind of flat, big, giant feet. That's another thing that I find funny about these guys. They were the first early humans to hunt very large mammals. And even then, think about how small they are. That's a big challenge if you're trying to hunt mammoths. And they were the first that we know of human or human people to actually build habitat structures. In other words, they built something to live in. They didn't find a, an abandoned cave or cavern. They actually built something to live in. When you think about... Well, that brings us to one of the most famous of our ancient ancestors and the closest one on the family tree to us in terms of Homo species, Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, otherwise known as the Neanderthal man. So when we think about these guys, they lived from about 200,000 years ago during the Ice Age all the way to about 30,000 years ago. When you read your book, you might have been surprised by the fact that these particular Homo species just did not have a huge population presence. They were not nearly as successful as something like Homo erectus in terms of duration of time. But they sure have a really good fossil record, and they are all, they are cool. Nevertheless, let's talk about them. They have very special uh, features about their body that separate them from o other Homo species, and several I can think about. They have a very heavy brow ridge, almost no forehead, angled cheekbones. They had huge nose. That huge nose, a couple of things that I wanted to point out from your lab, not just for breathing and humidifying warm air, they would also need the capacity for short, blunt running. These guys were hand combat hunters. So that's one reason they needed a big, heavy chest to be able to produce that amount of oxygen. They're real stocky and strong. They had a need to be. And they also had pretty good eyesight. Now, they were shorter and stockier than we are, immediate ancestors from Homo sapiens, and they had this flaring rib cage with shorter limbs. You should have noticed that, but they also had a bigger gap between the bones of like their legs and their forearms, which are definitely indication of muscular build. These guys were muscled up, very lean. Their brains were slightly larger than ours. So, you know, before you judge Neanderthals, think about the fact that they're a little bit more brain power. I'm not sure how they used it. I'm not sure necessarily that um, the brain was organized in the same way. I've not studied that, but it's interesting thoughts to think about. So modern humans have a brain size between 13 and 1400 cc's, and theirs was bigger, 1600 cc's. Now, important to note in definite test question, they were the first to bury their dead. Let's go back to me saying that there was a whole bunch of skeletons to look at. Okay. I'm not telling you there weren't skeletons of other species. I'm telling you they didn't bury their dead. So until we start burying dead, do we actually get a lot better at the ability to see multiple specimens for comparison? We know they were closed because we find fossil evidence and, and archaeological evidence of such. They made shelters. They made tools. They were very capable hunters. They likely did trading with uh, the next group that we'll look at. So they were prominent during their time. So Neanderthal, let's be clear, fossils have not been found in North America. They were restricted to Europe-Asia area. That brings us to Homo sapiens sapiens. You fall in this category. We call it Homo sapiens for short, but in reality it's Homo sapiens sapiens. They live from about 200,000 years ago to current. So let's compare that to Neanderthal man and say, hmm, there was a crossover. Not a comfortable topic but one that needs to be discussed. That means there was likely crossbreeding. Okay, now, not only likely, we know. And we know that because of DNA evidence. There are many humans living today as we speak that have a certain percentage of Neanderthal DNA. 
So you need to accept that and just kind of get over it and realize that this was going on at that time, whether you morally agree with it or not, understand that these were developing humans and 200,000 years ago, even up to 10,000, 15,000, certainly even up to 5,000 years ago, and if you want to be honest, probably up until about 2,000 years ago, humans didn't have the same structure of beliefs that many people do today. So this starts to get into that ethical realm. We need to take that out and realize that we're just looking at the science right here. These were very good hunters and gatherers. They first evolved in Africa and were very well suited skeleton wise to be able to migrate. If you looked at that, did that lab, you saw the long legs. They were long distance people, were built for that as compared to Neanderthal and certainly from chimpanzees, right? So that gave them an edge and advantage. They had a lighter build of their bones, so that made them more efficient for moving and migrating as opposed to Neanderthal. They have very large brains, but again, not as big as Neanderthal. The reorganization, however, of their brain and their skull allowed for the use of this brain to a higher capacity. Am I saying that's what caused Neanderthals to go extinct, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that this allowed an advantage for Homo sapiens. They have a less developed jaw, meaning it's not as heavy, it's not as thick. It has smaller teeth. Their brain size is a little smaller than Neanderthal, but very well organized and compacted. So when we talk about humans before where we are now, we refer to them as anatomically modern Homo sapiens. A-M-H is what that's referred to. One thing I think is important to note here is they develop culture, art, rituals, even wore jewelry as ornate, uh, ornate characteristics for individualism. Doesn't sound too different from us, does it? But nevertheless, they did, and we see this with their artifacts. They had very specialized tools, and by the time around 40,000 to 30,000 years or around, they had very specialized tools. So I think they were at an advantage over Neanderthal simply because they could make harpoons, bows and arrows. They learned how to sew. They learned how to make spear throwers like atlatls. They could do a lot of different really cool stuff that uh, gave them advantage over the pre-existing human species. Cro-Magnons are what we refer to as humans from about 35,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago. And these are the guys that lived in Europe and the Middle East and include successors of Neanderthals. And of course, we uh, have information about humans that have come to the Americas and kind of a different story board that is a whole different class. So we refer to these as anatomically modern humans for sure and they are slightly more robust and have a slightly larger cranium than we, we do. They got up to about 1600 cc's as well. But around 40,000 years ago, and you have to think about when Neanderthals kind of went extinct, <laughs> about 10,000 years later, they had developed much more advanced technology, extensive art rituals, they lived in communities, they were different than any kind of thing we had seen prior to this with any homo species. They were nomadic hunters, very advanced in their hunting skills, and they learned how to communicate by writing and left behind lots of what we call petroglyphs on manganese oxides known as uh, desert varnish. These, this is what we think of when we think about ancient man. So as we cover the highlights of hominid evolution, that's a lot to take in. It's a lot to think about where we originally came from, but I find it exceptionally interesting because it directly applies to us. So let's look at the highlights and then we'll kind of conclude this semester here. Prosimians, they were very common in the Eocene, but kind of declined. And then we're going to see the anthropoids divide into two groups, and we're going to see our kind start to come about. And as our family divides into the three groups, humans are in that lineup. So here we become as we start to make our amazing evolution through all of the earliest groups that we looked at to the Australopithecus and to the Homo species. Now, as our brain size increased and our body plan changed to meet the needs of our changing uh, environments and how we would operate in terms of moving migration, the body plans changed with it. And here we are today, one makes you wonder where will we be in the future. 
So now that we've concluded the semester with looking at all of the life forms, you can just kind of see the marvel of starting with nothing in terms of living life back in the Archean to our first prokaryote, then our eukaryote by the Paleo-Proterozoic, diversification of the Paleo-Proterozoic life form, and the Neo-Proterozoic, many different kinds. Then we start the Cambrian explosion, where we get all those invertebrates very quickly, and then fish, and then we get amphibians and plants that start on land, and we get our insects on land, and then you, you know the story. And you see that most of our evolution has really happened in 542 million years and humans in 7 million years. Understand the grandeur of that, the miracle of that, and appreciate that it's going to continue as long as the right elements to support life will occur. So that kind of goes back to some of your physical geology days of understanding that is a finite amount of time. But probably not for humans. In all fairness, humans have been a very short-lived group of organisms in comparison to most organisms on the planet. While we think of ourselves as unique, special, we are, but what makes it any more special than one group of trilobites that might have only lived for seven million years? And that's kind of what I'm wanting you to leave with this semester is understanding that life is fragile. Life is important and value your own. We're only here for a small segment of time and we need to make the most of what we have, the gifts we have, make the most of the knowledge that we have. And humans have at this point the most advanced technology that we know of, of any species that's lived on planet Earth. Of course, that could raise the next set of questions. What about extraterrestrial intelligence? That's where I'm thinking is, think about what you're capable of and make the most of that. Take what you've learned from this class and don't just apply it in a scientific view. Look at your personal life, look at your future career goals and consider how much you have to offer and maximize those opportunities. It's been such a privilege to have shared geologic time with you this semester. And I appreciate each and every one of you and your contributions to our course. Thanks. Bye.